You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. With more than 30 weekly podcasts, HRN has something for every food lover. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. Hello, everybody. Matt Patterson here, and I've got a little bonus treat for you, Meet and 3 listeners, today. This fall, HRN launched a series called The Culinary Call Sheet. The show has two hosts. It's Darren Bresnitz, who longtime HRN listeners will know from his work with his brother Greg on Snacky Tunes. And while he's been hosting Snacky Tunes with HRN since 2009, he's been working in the world of food TV for even longer than that. And then his co-conspirator is April Jones, who is an Emmy Award-winning television producer and director in her own right. Earlier today, I spoke with April and Darren about the show, So we're going to play that conversation for you now, and then we'll be presenting the first half of one of their episodes with Clifford Endo of Vice Media. If you like what you hear and you want the rest, head over to the Culinary Call Sheet wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe. We've got links for you in the show notes. Enjoy. Darren, April, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having us. It's our pleasure to be here. So we are very excited about the launch of the Culinary Call Sheet. I wanted to start with this. I know you have both been working in culinary media for many years, and I am wondering who got started working with food and video first. That would definitely be uh, my main man, Darren Bresnitz. Yeah, I actually got into it back in 2001, um, was at the Boston University Communications School, and had got into the internship program and literally cracked open the yellow pages. And there was a food show listed in there called the Phantom Gourmet. And I wound up just calling them. And during that time, I had been watching a lot of the original Iron Chef and the Naked Chef and just calling up one of the creators of the show blindly. And we just started talking. And, you know, you have to remember, like, back in the day, being into food TV or food media in general wasn't even a thing. And so I think that because I was watching shows and I could talk to him about meat to this day, I remember and he and I meat really connected over the three. lobster battle One for meat, the original three Iron sides. Chef. Food, That's pretty much what got my internship. Um, I will probably say meal. it wasn't my for four-page single-space resume that listed literally everything <laughs> I'd done in my life. Um, and I was so happy that um, to this day, now knowing the audacity of sending – a document like that to any sort of professional uh, didn't keep me out of the industry. <laughs> Fun fact, Darren's current resume, 20 pages long. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I took the kids to the zoo today, so I have a whole new section of my resume. I feel <laughs> really good about that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, yeah, so it's been um, 21 years since I've been working in food TV, and I've loved, um, well, I mean, I've loved every minute of it as much as anyone can love the ups and downs of a long career in, uh, in, in media. Sure, sure. And then I assume you've held like different types of roles within the industry over time. Like, is there sort of, I don't know, one, one word you would use to describe like most of your work? Or could you tell us about some of those, some of those different positions you've held? Sure. I mean, look, I like to say that once a PA, always a PA. Um, And so I consider myself always willing to get in the mix, but I've worked my way up both on the production side to be a showrunner. And then I've been on the network side as the director of original series. So I've been able to start all the way at the, the entry and work my way up to some of the most senior levels of the food media industry. Cool, cool, cool. And so April, I assume that there's at least a somewhat similar story there of working from the, the, the bottom to the top of certain projects. But um, could you just tell people like when you entered the industry and sort of uh, how did you find yourself at that first job? Yeah. For me, it was just straight nepotism. <laughs> I'm kidding. It wasn't that at all. I didn't go to school for communications. I didn't go to school for TV. I totally fell into it by accident. I started as an assistant uh, to a massive, a massively successful executive producer. And it was sort of like a a caricature of what you would imagine an executive producer is. Like I'd come into work and he'd drop off his teacup chihuahua in my lap and make me do his traffic school. So <laughs> I was I was just sort of desperate to um, 
get into any sort of department. So I was eventually hired out from under him and did a lot of really trashy, incredible, awful um, reality shows. And then in about 2009, I interviewed at Rock Shrimp, which is Mr. Bobby Flay's company. And I was hired there as a low-level producer. And it was like, you know, finding true love after dating a bunch of bums. And I've been in it ever since. Yeah, I remember that. So in the, okay, so listeners, if you haven't listened to the first episode uh, of The Culinary Call Sheet, you should go back and do that. That's not the one you're about to hear. But uh, in that intro for the first episode, you know, April, you specifically shouted out Bobby Flay yeah. for giving you your first directing job and for being really like positive force on you early in your career. And I'm wondering, like, Darren, is there somebody that you like to point to in that same way that like had a, a, a real strong mentorship role that you haven't shouted out yet? Well, it would be at the same company, Rock Shrip, mm. um, where I was the AP for Throwdown with Bobby Flay. And I would need to shout out Emily Benson. Um, she was the producer director who I was an AP for. And she really taught me how to produce. She taught me how to break stories, how to prep interview questions, how to take field notes, um, how to give notes on post-production. Um, so I would give her the shout out for the mentorship, but for the chef that gave me my break in producing was also Bobby Flay. Um, and Rock Shrimp is where April and I actually met. We didn't work together, but yeah. we worked in the same office. Um, it goes without saying that he has given a lot of producers a lot of talent, a lot of people in the industry, their brain, yes. both in front of and behind the camera. Yeah. And um, he still does to this day. I know a lot of people who have been able to get to the next level of their career with him somewhere involved. Cool. Yeah, that's funny. I didn't, I, you know, I I didn't realize yet that I, I hadn't heard where you guys met. So that's, <laughs> that's very cool. That it, it's very fitting that it was on, uh, at, at working on these kind of projects. Yeah, We keep cool. saying we're going to have to do a super cut episode of all of our, like, super fangirl club about Bobby because in every single episode mm -hmm. somebody has a story for the most part or we come back to a story for Bobby because he has he's just really especially in the food world I mean he was an icon early on and is still on the food network and I think that he never I don't know he never stopped extending his hand to folks and that I don't know he's a great dude uh, His career <laughs> yeah. in food media also speaks to if you stick around long enough, you wind up working with similar people or people who have worked with other people who have chosen to stay in this industry because it's really tough. But those who stick it out and those who grind it out and those who keep going back into this specific line of, of video production, this type of genre, it winds up being the same people. And you wind up just finding the best people to work with and you gravitate towards them and you all just wind up swapping positions show to show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that that makes a lot of sense. And I mean, <laughs> the tone you just struck there reminds me of like, it feels like this project is at least partially looking to be like a, a toolkit for folks who are yeah. hoping to leave their mark on the world of food TV. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, so far, each episode has sort of struck me as like a roadmap for a career path that like, it's like a roadmap for a career that won't actually let you have a replicable roadmap. <laughs> so it's sort of a, a crazy idea in that way. But like everybody's story is different. And that's like what makes this show as engaging as it is, it's got like a how I built this kind of storytelling that. vibe to it that I think will appeal to people that, you know, even if even if they don't want to be in front of or behind the camera. For sure. We like that was sort of the goal is like um, I think Darren kind of called it from the beginning an unofficial an unofficial mentorship. I think mm -hmm. I, I always call it a, like a how to and how do you because it's not quite a how to and it's not quite just how somebody did something. Um, we hope that. Like you said, people that are just curious about it or just, in, in truth, a lot of the advice or stories that our guests have so graciously shared with us translate to a, a myriad of industries. 
And Mm -hmm. I think some people have given us some like really solid, hard directives about how to do things. And also just sort of like these reflective um, journeys of catharsis that are helpful too for careers. So we've been actually super stoked just being a part of it too. I know (laughs) Darren and I joke every time we have an episode, like, should we change our job? Are we doing this correctly? (laughs) (laughs) I think you start to see a couple of through lines with our different interviews. Everyone's path is different, but at the core, there's a love for food. There's a love for storytelling. There's a love for using food to tell stories. And then just this tenacity and hard work yeah. and drive to keep showing up. And you start finding those common elements, at least with the people who work in this type of, of um, medium. And you start just to gravitate there. And the, the people that are drawn to food TV and, and using food as a jumping off point tend to have similar interests, tend to have similar drives. Um, and you can really tell once you get on set, you're like, oh, this is a, this is a food crew. Like this, these are people who know food, who love food, who have been around food together. And that's when you really get your best work. And you just all wind up having a very similar shorthand. And um, there's a lot of us who are still doing today who cut our teeth in this very specific time in New York. I would say like the mid early 2000s to like the 20 teens. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of us have come out from there. And then a lot of us are now trying to um, instill what we've learned and find people who are the next generation and just, you know, help pass along some of that information that was a pretty hard fought to win and to learn and to know. And that's sort of why we're doing the show as well. So if you want to get into this world, which can sometimes be closed off, we're saying, here's some inspiration, here's some jumping off points, and here's some way for you to get into the game. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the reasons I think the show is going to be so valuable is it's like, you guys aren't, (laughs) you're not out of the game. You know, you're not like, (laughs) you're not talking about something you're not doing anymore. You, you, I I know from our production schedule that like April, you're running around (laughs) far flung places doing projects. I'm, I'm curious, are there anything, is there anything that's ongoing or current that you either of you are able to uh, speak about? for current projects? I mean, I, I've worked on a couple different international um, food shows that are very exciting because while they're not quite etymology shows, uh, they've taken us via food through um, many different places domestically and internationally. Um, and that's a massive series that I am hoping will see the light of day. Um, for a lot of people that aren't in the industry right now, we're sort of in the midst of a lot of mergers. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of things are happening. The industry is changing as it does. So a lot of the work we're doing is sort of in this tenuous place. Um, as you know, I just got back from London from shooting a food project, which I also can't speak about. Um, so <laughs> there's work out there. It's happening. So mysterious. But yeah. Yeah. Um... Um, we're working on a development project and waiting to hear back on some other series if they're going to go for a second season or a third season, and if they need more people. I mean, I don't, I don't want to have you jinxing it. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, it's just what it is, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's great. I think April and I having each other. Because right now we're lucky enough to have projects we're working on. You know, we've been doing this show long enough already where we've both been in between projects. And so I think having this community and realizing that there are ups and downs to a long career, even a short career in this field, and that those downs might mean the phone is ringing or you're not getting emails. And part of that has nothing to do with you. I mean, very much right now, a lot of people... (laughs) are sitting waiting for people to call back because giant mergers are happening in the world of unscripted and alternative media. And while I can feel lonely, we're hoping to build a community that people can be a part of where they're just like, oh, okay, like more people than not are going through this right now. So just mm-hmm. what can I do? Can I do some writing? Can I just get away from my computer? Can I go run? Can I go travel? Can I get out in the world? 
and then wait for the the flow of the ebb and flow to, yeah. to come back in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay, so mergers between big companies might be like an entirely separate level, but this episode <laughs> that we're about to play pe- for people is m- maybe one level below, but it was like you, you spoke with someone about, you know, uh, what the decision makers might be looking yeah. for when they're thinking about projects, mm-hmm. basically. So could you could you tell people what who, who we're about to hear from yeah. and, and uh, I don't know, maybe a highlight of the combo or whatever you want to sure. tell us about it to set it up? Absolutely. Um, so in the clip that you're going to hear a little bit of, this is an episode with Clifford Endo, who is the VP of content at Vice Media. And he is actually a dear friend of mine. I worked with him over a decade ago at Food Network, uh, where at the time he was working in culinary, he says in a very low level, but I've always seen him as just such a a, a big guy, a, a person that you look up to. So in this episode, he's walking us through what networks are looking for, especially as it pertains to food, especially as it pertains to development and pitching and how to take your ideas and distill them in a way that you can take them anywhere, whether that is for a vice or for a food network or for a, a digital platform for social media. He really gives a lot of insight into that um, and sort of to you know what Darren was speaking about earlier about how we hope to let people in. I think something that was really great that Clifford says in the episode, um, which won't give too much away, is that, you know, one of his definitions of success is seeing the people around you surpass you. And Mm -hmm. I think our hope is with these episodes that we get a lot of people that get in the game and just like change it. Yeah. Yeah. And I loved what we talked about as well from a creative side. And I still, to this day, marvel at this where you can have an idea in your brain Mm. turn into something real and physical and get out into the world that people can watch. I'll never get over that. And if I do, that means I'm done in this industry. (laughs) That means I'm, I've just completely retired. But, um, (laughs) yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) The irony is, the irony is, is that by the time something probably, if you've created something, if you've been lucky enough to create something and sell a show and get it on TV, your desire to actually watch it when it airs is probably close to to almost nothing because you've watched it a million times already. Um, Makes sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> you know um, this already, which, Matt. <laughs> yes. You know this already. But um, um, outside of that, that irony, the ability to – I've been on set with things that I've thought up. Um, yeah. Lucky enough to be to have been there and been like, this came out of my brain and then enough people believe in the idea to help me work on that idea, to make the idea better. Cause that really is also what Cliff talks about is, is having yeah. a team and, and that pops up in some of our later episodes is, is really building a team and finding right people to work with you and you're all there. And, and as you get down in your career, when you can get away from being like, this is my idea and shift it to be like, I helped bring these people together to create something. It's really beautiful. And Cliff Clifford really talks about that, about creating together and working together and building something with other people. Cool. Well, yes. Yeah, so, uh, you know, HRN is just another community of uh, people build, working together to build things and put out all this great content. And we love uh, the fact that we have been able to work with you on the culinary call sheet. For listeners, you're about to hear episode three. We're going to only play you the first half. If you like Mm -hmm. what you hear, you have to jump over to the feed. The link will be in the show notes. Uh, Subscribe so that you can get the rest of the episodes as you come out. If you're interested in hearing more about April and Darren, I have heard whispers that there might be content a little later in the season that'll go like <laughs> real in depth with them, <laughs> let you know everything you want to know. We're just going to read our diaries. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, if, if we can time it right with the holiday season, I'll be uh, distilling Laka recipes for all those that are interested. There we go. The trick is get the moisture out of your potatoes. I'm just going to say it right now. <laughs> So now you probably don't have to listen to that episode, but maybe wow. there's more tips. Maybe there's See, more tips. <laughs> and just like this show, there's things there's things you wouldn't expect in every single episode. So exactly. uh, <laughs> definitely uh, hope you enjoy this episode. Thank you, Darren and April, for Thank coming you, on. Thank you, Matt.
We appreciate you oh, so. Thank you so much. And let me just say that uh, I've been proud to call Heritage Radio Network my community and home for well over a decade. So thank you for continuing to open your doors to, to me and to us and letting us share the stories that mean so much to our community. Yeah, we appreciate it. And we hope everybody enjoys. Hello. I'm Hi. so happy to be talking to you from across the pond. I know. London town coming at you. London calling? <laughs> it is London calling. Good one, Darren. Thank you. We were lucky enough to get into this industry at a relatively younger and early part of our career. Yeah. And our guest today, Cliff Endo, what's so interesting about his journey into food TV is about how he didn't come to it early. He came to it a bit later. Yeah. And he came to it after he had done a few other jobs, a few other careers. Including in entertainment. Yeah. Including in entertainment. So he he got a taste of this world and he took a hard look at it. I believe yeah. he's like, I'm only going to do stuff that I really care about. Now, the path he shares with us is not as straightforward as just deciding one day like, oh, I'm going to be doing only what I want to do. And then one day I'll be running... Uh, digital content over at Vice, but the intention and that the having the idea of that career is really inspiring. Yeah, he's somebody who's had quite a storied path. Um, a really charming, charismatic person, just someone who has such a great energy that even when I met him many, many years ago, had no idea the various twists and turns that he took to get here. Mm. He is now the vice president of content at Vice Media. But prior to this, he was hosting things for Vox and Eater. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, he was culinary producing and any sort of culinary role, to be honest, on many, many Food Network projects. As everybody will come to learn, prior to that was an actor and a graffiti artist and <laughs> did producing at an ad agency and worked at a restaurant. I think a lot of people think that you come into entertainment because that's what you want. It's so hard to break in that people just start there and they work at it and they break in, but there are a million tiny paths underneath all these successes. I think what we're all starting to learn is that it is an ebb and flow. There yes. is no producer that you talk to who has this just, it's always up. It's always a straight line. It's always, oh, you know, the next project. Because in this field, it can the phone could be dry. And then like one day out of nowhere, yes. you want to do this. Yes. Uh, we need someone. Um, you know, that was one of my last projects was just that, like, hey, we need someone. And I went, I can be that someone. I'm free right now. Which is important to say, I can be that someone because, as we all say many times, there is no straight path. And you just have to say, can I walk through this door? <laughs> mm. This door that opened in front of me, do I have what it takes to walk through it and stay in that room? And I think that's a lot of how this happens. And you figure out what skill set of yours can translate, whether you've done it or not. And then you also need people in your corner who you can call. I do want to ask you, because I know that we are going to ask Cliff, about the shift from just producing to becoming a representative of a network, what that was mm -hmm. like for you. You know, the head of programming will, will say, we need this type of show. We need, we're looking for this. Um, this is what our, our advertisers are responding to. This is what the data is showing. You know, hey, we have all these, these different metrics and these different data points. Um, let's try and get a programming. Let's try and get a show like this. You know, we're launching a travel channel. Oh, you know, we're getting into crime now. Like, oh, like we, we have found that food plus puppets Plus gardening <laughs> Not is, is what everyone's going after on TikTok. Is there a 30-minute version of, of that trend that we can hit? Um, so, you know, the programming team is looking for the dev team to come up with ideas. And then the dev team is developing the ideas. And the development team is then working with production and the network to, to create it. So it, it's a really good ecosystem. And when the ecosystem is working, it's a really great process because you're getting good data points. You're like, okay, this worked. What we're going to hear from Clifford is how, as a creator, as a writer, as somebody who's looking to pitch, as somebody who's looking to dev, how you could find these holes, how you can pay attention and see where these holes are so you can give something different, so you can give something that the network needs, that the viewers need and don't even know they need, while still adding a through line of comfort and accessibility and that sort of same but different, you know? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah. And dev work development, 
is something that you've done a lot of. Yeah, I mean, you know, being on the network side uh, is really great. You know, I think it's a really interesting time in the food and unscripted space of just what people are looking for. Um, and the great thing about someone like Cliff and what he has access to is that he gets to look at all the trends that are swirling in the Vice ecosystem. And he gets to pull maybe from social because he sees a trend working there, or he gets to pull from the music site because it's working there, or he gets to pull from the the news site because he saw a great story. And then he gets to filter that through his own needs and push that out in a new format. And having access to all those different data points and all those different creative inputs, absolutely, he's lucky to have. But I think also if you really want development, you need to as well. Even if you just work in, let's just say, food. You should be reading lots of things that don't have to do with food mm-hmm. because the shows that are, are, are that are going to go now are food and yes. Food is the doorway. As we all know, like food is the place where you come to meet, where you come to gather, where you come to talk, where you come to commune. And it's not just the recipe anymore. Yeah. All right. So look, let's, uh, let's get Clifford in the mix. Are you ready to chat with Clifford? Yes. Let's add his name to the culinary call sheet. You love that. I don't know. We need something. Okay. <laughs> I'm keeping that in. Hi, Cliff. Hi, April. It's so good to have you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for asking me to come here. You and I have worked together off and on for, I don't know, probably a decade? Yes. Oh, my God. A long time. A long time. I met you as a culinary producer, and you did a lot of recipe development for series. I think, I was- I think you actually met me even beyond that. Like you, I, you've always kind of been like the head honcho on Mm -hmm, mm this. That's how I've known April always head honcho. (laughs) Always. You're always kind of running the show Mm -hmm. and it's, it's just your personality that you may have thought of. I think I was like, I started off as like prepping or like washing dishes. I think is where I first, I moved up as the, really, but I think in the beginning I was like lowest person on the totem pole. My gosh. But that's just a testament to who you are. There's no clear path. No. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in culinary media? I've been in and out of a restaurant since I was like 14. Mm. I've always had an appreciation for it. But like, it wasn't the path because I have like immigrant parents and they're like, you can be any kind of lawyer you want to be. <laughs> sure. <you know? laughs> Here's your one or two choices. Yeah, you can be <laughs> any kind of doctor you be. You can run exactly. so many businesses. <laughs> and then like I dropped out of MBA school, got a theater degree. I'm sure they love that. Loved it. Great day in the family. Both my parents are academics. Begrudgingly supportive, but like begrudgingly. <laughs> I was in New York and I was like trying to do the theater thing. It just wasn't like, I just wasn't my bag. Like I, you know, I had an agent and I was working and I was just like, you know what? Like, I, I don't, I don't really like, I'm not digging this acting thing. Like it's not, mm. it's not for me. And I did some film TV stuff, but I always kind of like, it seemed like the creativity and the real shot calling was happening. Not on this side of the camera, but on that. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. And I was like, yeah. what? Like, what is all that stuff? And I like, I like figuring out puzzles and the way to do things. Then it took a big turn. I got hired on to um, an advertising agency. Mm. Mm-hmm. And then I just was like, oh, this advertising thing is kind of cool. You get to think of like ideas and how to execute them. And it was like fun. And I started producing without really knowing I was producing. Right. Mm, like yeah. Making stuff happen. And I was like, whoa, like this lifestyle is like high energy, completely addictive. The adrenaline runs. I love this. Company bottoms out. Mm. They let go of all their creative staff. And I'm like sitting there. I'm like, I don't know what I need to do with my life. I was watching a lot of culinary shows. I was watching the Bourdain Cooks tour thing. And, sure, sure. And I was like, I'm only going to do stuff that, I'm, that makes me happy. And that's it. Go to culinary school because I'm obsessed with this. And I heard about this guy named Dave Arnold who was at French Culinary Institute. Yeah. It's like, who's mm-hmm. there? Mm-hmm. Like, I'm going to knock on his door every day, which I did. And the only reason why I got in with him is because one day he needed help moving boxes. And I was like, That's sure, how you do it. move boxes for him. Get in how you can. He kept showing up. What year was this? This was like 08, okay. maybe, down there. Mm-hmm. I was also just like already like – kind of old to be starting out as a line cook like it's it's a young man's game young woman's game young person's game mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the wear and tear but i also missed that production element and 
I went back to culinary school and the career advisor was like, well, we have this internship at Food Network. And I was like, hmm. I was like, I've been a director at an ad agency. Like the internship is like not really my deal right now. Like mm-hmm. I'm still consulting for companies and that, but I really, I felt like this was my lane. Like I really felt something like this is the thing that I need to do. So I was like, okay. They're like internships for six months. I was like, I'll give you four. <laughs> I don't know who, <laughs> nice. who I thought I was. <laughs> yeah. We're shooting an internship. And it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I yeah. Four day like, weekends. Please. Here's my writer. <laughs> yeah. And I got hired as an intern. So I did a bunch of in- interviews as for the culinary producing department. Found some amazing people like Daniel Strain. Shout out to Daniel. Fucking believed in me. Yeah. And gave me every opportunity. Dave Mechowitz too. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Culinary producing job for tra- travel channel i just showed up and i was like i'm just gonna work my fucking ass off i'm gonna keep my head down and work my way up it was like beat bobby flay season one i was the shopper mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then ended up running the whole goddamn thing on the culinary side i was just like i am just gonna put in the work what was your end goal i wanted to, to make food tv stuff and food show and develop them and be really good because I found out the most satisfying thing I could do was like come up with the show. That was the mm-hmm. thing that excited me the most. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I just like I had to leave and and do that. And I jumped into digital for Vox and for Eater, running development. Um, I was doing development for TV and then found my way to Vice. Vice I've always been a fan of. And when they called, I picked up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most important part. Yeah. Going back a little bit, sometimes it's easy to look at a, a, a Beat Bobby Flay or a Healthy Appetite or Kelsey's Essentials and be like, oh, the, the chef just comes up with a show idea and that's it. Yeah. When did you become aware that there were producers and developers making cooking shows? I mean, you realize it day one, you're on your first set. I think, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, once you see the communication lines happening, you're like, oh, wait a minute. Sure. It's also kind of cool when you're like young and then, and you see like the person in the booth and then <laughs> like, the monitors in front of them. Like, you don't really know what's going on, but you're like, that's rad. Like, yeah. they have like the Death Star in front of them. And it's yeah. like, <laughs> then you figure out what they kind of do. And it's just like, oh, like, there's a lot of fast thinking. Yeah. If your talent, whoever that chef is, the problems probably should be solved before it gets to yeah. them. Yeah. So I'm actually like really more interested in the process than the result. So as soon as I started seeing that and the creative calls that someone gets to make, mm. I was on this crazy pilot that shall not be named. <laughs> we all have those. We all have them. Oh my God. We all have so much them. stuff that you leave off your resume and be like, no. But sorry, I was working on this pilot that shall not be named. And it, how do I say this? It needed some creative guidance that was a little bit out of my realm of just producing it on the culinary side. So I helped, helped really actually make the show. Sure, sure. Right? And I was just like, I was like, wow, this is really great. And and I just took my moment right there. Mm. The owner of the company stopped by and was like, hey, thank you for all of this. And I was like, hey, are you looking for more of this stuff? And it was like, I have ideas. And I was like, listen, like, you don't have to pay me. I have two months off right now between gigs. Can I just come and develop stuff for you and work with the development team? And you only have to pay me if the, if the show gets sold. Hmm. And so I did it. And I fucking went to that office. I showed up. And I started developing stuff with that team. I didn't have development experience. They did not know that. <laughs> but like, I was like stealing every bit of language from them, every bit of vocabulary from them, taking the trade. They were telling me about stuff. And I would just sit there and I would crank. And I'd mm. crank and I'd crank, and I'd crank format after format. And I'd learn something every time, just keep doing and doing and doing and doing it. Yeah. Um, and that's how it started. It was taking that moment where I had a really big win and using it to turn it into something else. You know, as you have leveled up through your career, like how much of it would you say to someone that they really need to know or how much can they sort of just figure it out? Yeah, I think even with that development thing, like I always approached it with transparency that is rare these days. Mm. Listen, like Mm -hmm. I don't know this much. Here's what I can do. And I'm very blatant about my skill set, right? And literally just opening yourself up like that. I want to learn about this. Here's what I'm willing to give. 
I will sit here and show up and do this work for you if you let me ride the coattails. And I was in board meetings with executives on my first pitch within like a month. Mm. You should take that path of learning along the way. But like some of that is trading whatever you have to get something out of someone else and being very transparent. There's no class for what we're doing. No. No. Like this isn't fucking accounting. You know what I mean? Like it's just like being a good producer is about and is about learning the best part of yourself to bring out the best in other people and understanding who you are as a person. In production, you're gonna use all those skills. Yes. You don't think you are, but like you should be gathering every tool that will make you good at this thing. And the greatest producing trick I've ever learned is steal everything. Can you define? Not, not like the stationary or the. Yes, 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 yes. Like steal every method, every way out, every fucking producer magic trick. Cause like, you know, like I feel like if someone's teaching a class about producing, like, I don't know. Maybe, I just feel like good producing is just being the culmination of everyone you've ever worked mm, with. Mm-hmm. And literally just like opening yourself up like that and just being like, I want to learn about this. Here's what I'm willing to give. Yes. And that my give on that was I will sit here and show up and do this work for you if you let me ride the coattails. And I was in board meetings with executives. I, I just worked my way up. And I just like being a person who gets to make a show is like, that's like such a gift. Yeah. You know what I mean? Rarefied air. Like it still blows my mind to this day that you can literally think of something and then it's on a screen for like a million people to watch. Like that's fucking mind blowing. Yeah. Like I'm still like in shock about that to this day. Like that same, the magnitude of that never gets lost on me. It makes me really bashful. It keeps you super honest about stuff. (laughs) Yeah. I think once you lose that appreciation that something can get out of your brain and into the world and become a reality, if you get jaded on that, then it's time to to pack up and to go somewhere else to a different industry. I think so too. And I think that it's like, bashful is a very kind word too. It's just like, it also makes you very real about like how you manifest your, this is going to be a weird turn, but I really believe in this. It's like, for me, it's just like that whole scariness too and being in awe of it is also just like, it's actually a healthy redirection of self-doubt mm. for me personally. Yeah. Like I think everyone battles with self-doubt and there's like three results out of that. You quit, which is the easiest way. Sure. You become super fucking toxic. <laughs> you know I mean? Yeah. Which we've all seen. Or you learn how to use that to keep you super honest down to earth, open, and to also like punch holes in everything that you do to try to make it perfect. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think that's the one where it actually like self-doubt can actually make you better. Yeah. Like I love blatant honesty where someone's just like, hey, I don't know this. Like I'd really like to learn because I think you're expected to know a lot of stuff. Yeah. Agreed. Well, there's immediate trust too. Whereas if you hire somebody who says they can do it and you're finding out in a low level way that they really don't know what they're doing, yeah. you immediately are on edge <laughs> and you're like, well, yeah. well, like what else don't I know about this person? No, because you just like, I have to do this. Right. For me, this job is nothing if it's not for the people around you. Mm-hmm. Like I want to hear from them. I want to know what's going on. And I also want to be able to jump in and bridge however I can so that we as a team can get through and have like a beautiful product. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that like someone saying that they don't know, but they're, they'll show up and they'll, they'll keep doing it until they figure it out. They really want to learn it. That's like, how can you not want to invest time in that person? This episode is brought to you by Roberta's home of heritage radio network for 10 years. Roberta's was founded in Bushwick in 2008 and has become one of the most iconic restaurants in the country. HRN made its home inside of Roberta's in 2009, and together they have become part of the DIY fabric of the neighborhood. Roberta's, the pizza restaurant, is open for lunch and dinner seven days a week and serves much more than just the famous wood-fired pizzas. Their team dreams up new salads, pastas, and sandwiches on the regular. 
Roberta's tiki bar is alive and well in the back garden, serving up frozen drinks in the summer and hot toddies in the winter. Stop by the bakery and takeout spot next door for fresh breads, sticky buns, and pizzas to go. And of course, there's the two Michelin-starred Blanca tucked away in the garden for truly daring diners. But Roberta's also extends beyond Bushwick, with multiple locations in New York City and now in Los Angeles. You can also find their frozen pies in grocery stores around the country. The spirit of Roberta's, like Heritage Radio Network, is everywhere. Here's to many more years of pizza-powered radio. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. So as you started to shift out of production and more into development and then onto the network side, what sort of mental shift or approach did you have to make personally? You're no longer on a one-lane highway. Mm. Like you're on an LA freeway mm-hmm. and you have to be aware of every single car that is occupying every single lane around you. Every position that you move up, you're adding another lane on the highway that you have to be aware of. Mm. Right. And I think development's another thing. It's just like, it's not just about having an idea, right? Like that's what you think it is. And then as development goes, you're like, no, ideas aren't really that great. It's only becomes real (laughs) creative when it can work. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The shift that you have to make, I think that's most beneficial is like being able to have an idea, then being able to put it through the box of like, does it work? Do a format? What kind of format is it? What does it achieve? Mm -hmm. And forces you to do a lot more research, right? Like what else is out there that's similar? Yeah. But it also forces you to like, I think rely on other people to really punch holes in it. Yeah. Yeah. And just be like, can you take a look at this? Can you feel this out? Can you let me know? And I think it's just like, (laughs) I think when you're in development, you also get more notes. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's better in the front end, yeah. Yeah, yeah. B- better like, than when you're in production. You're like, oh, uh, Act Three is not working. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the camera guys are here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the production notes are all like, I mean, Jesus, what a minefield. Make it bigger. Jeez. Oh, I absolutely. Could you make it like <laughs> pop a little bit more? Absolutely. Pop. What? What? What is that? What do you want, pop wise? Yeah. Like you're saying, if you're developing an idea, really think about how this edits down. Like, sure, this is a beautiful, massive scene. How do I get it into five minutes and have it make sense? Like, <laughs> what is the format of this series? But every time I hire a producer, I w- I definitely lean towards people who have been in post and edit because yes, that is a special hell that we all deserve to experience to be better. So much, especially in the digital space, is data-driven. Like to the second, you can see retention, you can see drop-off, you can see engagement. Um, and it's good to have that data. I think it's it's better to have that data than living in a world of completely guessing in the dark. But how do yeah. you balance looking at the data, trusting the data, and then also saying, I need to try something different to create something that's gonna break through, to create something that feels fresh? People are using it left and right, and it's all over the place, and data's worth its weight in gold. But I think that, like, it has to lift up the creative because, like, the one thing that always wins is connectivity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? That's, like, it's the difference between being seen and being remembered. And I will choose being remembered all any day of the week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... Mm -hmm can't lose that connectivity in that to an audience member because the thing is is no matter what we do in this industry we're in the service industry hmm. and we're, we're here I, I i know i have a, a different view than a lot of people with this but i'm here to like serve an audience right mm-hmm. i agree my role here is just to like serve our audience in the best way possible with the highest quality work that we can get possible with, with, with stuff that is, that is going to incite curiosity and wonder and, and engagement from them on all different levels. And I think that like data helps me hone that in, Mm. but it'll never overtake the moment that I need to like find the humanity in what you're doing and find that moment of connectivity. Yeah. But you don't want to just be like, I'm just trying to produce for what I think people might want. How do you find that balance of when you're creating shows that feel unique to you as a person and as a producer and as a creator, but also are hitting what a network might be looking for? I mean, what a network might be looking for is is a conundrum. 
Um, but I think I always, I, I do this thing. If you want to hear Cliff's answer to that question and many more, you have to head over to the Culinary Call Sheet wherever you get your podcasts. If you need a link, it's in the show notes. And thank you for listening. This show is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.